Um, can I just say what a pleasure it is to be here at the round table and uh, specifically to be amongst so many people who have such a passion for addressing the, uh, the great challenges that face people with intellectual disabilities. Julian, uh, obviously, thank you very much for your uh, invitation and for the work that you uh, do at the Department of uh, Developmental Disability uh, Neuropsychiatry here at UNSW. Um, Eileen Baldry, thank you again. Um, Eileen and I have uh, intersected over probably, I won't say decades, we'll keep it, just a few years, um, in many areas um, of social justice and I'm delighted uh, that she is now the, uh, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor here at UNSW, but this week the Acting Vice-Chancellor, so go Eileen. Um, Jim Simpson uh, from the Council of Intellectual Disability, the other uh, colleagues here, Alana and Michael from the Council of Intellectual Disability. I've had the pleasure of, um, of working with the, uh, the Council over many years, um, many, many years, and uh, I was uh, the Shadow Minister for quite some years for, um, d develop or for disability, and so I had many, many meetings and many discussions and, uh, and uh, developed policies for the then opposition, the Liberal National Opposition in that area. So thank you uh, to you and to your colleagues for uh, uh, educating us along the way about what the big issues are. Um, Ian Hickey uh, from the Brain and Mind Centre from Sydney Uni um, and others who are here today, thank you for the work you're about to do as part of this round table. Now I know that uh, this is the second round table, 2013, and as a result of that first round table, there has been a lot of work done, but I think uh, there's much more to do. Um, in the various portfolios that I've had, both in opposition and in government, uh, I have seen the challenges of people with intellectual disabilities, disabilities more broadly, uh, and of course the intersection with mental health. Um, I'm currently obviously the Minister for Health, um, but I have been the Attorney General, Minister for Justice, uh, and in that uh, role uh, I visited many uh, prisons and uh, juvenile justice centres, and I have to say um, it, uh, it concerns me greatly that we have so many people with uh, intellectual disabilities and disabilities who uh, have ended up, I think, in very adverse circumstances in our justice system. Justice is one of the areas of challenge. Uh, education. I started my life as a, uh, as a teacher many, many years ago, a science teacher. Um, and teachers, I think, uh, maybe have a little bit of training these days, but certainly in my day we had uh, next to no training and I don't think it's adequate even today to understand all the aspects of being able to uh, support and work um, to achieve really great outcomes for people with intellectual disabilities. Health and mental health um, have their own challenges. Um, over the years, I have not only seen this from a professional perspective as a minister and as a shadow minister, I've also seen it from local MPs' point of view I've seen it from my own family's point of view with people with uh, you know, family members who have uh, um, disabilities. Um, and I guess the one thing that struck me over my life is that uh, as soon as your child is diagnosed with a disability, the carer or carers, the parents, it becomes a challenge from day one to try and get the services you need. That's the greatest challenge that you then face, literally, for your entire living life as a carer or a parent, to make sure that your child, whether it's a one-day-old child or a 40-year-old child or a 60-year-old child, it's to ensure that you get the support and the services that your child needs. And it is a battle. Our system is still a battle. I think it's a lot better than it was 20, 25 years ago, but it's still a battle. When there are a combination of uh, issues, including, for example, the, uh, the big topic that you're looking at today, uh, mental health intersecting with uh, disability, it becomes just one more giant step that you have to cope with. The system itself, health, from my experience, people do want to do the right thing, but quite often the doctors, uh, the nurses, the allied health staff don't really know how to work with people with a disability. That, of course, is the challenge, one of the challenges that you will be facing here and was faced in 2013, the first 
round table. How do we actually get that message out? How do we train our staff? How do we get them to listen? And I think listening is part of the key. Part of the key. The one thing I have learnt uh, over my long years on this earth, I guess, is that it is the parents, it is, it is usually the parents, not say it's always, but it's usually the parents, it's usually the carers, it's usually the close family members who know most about how to support their loved one. And of course the person with the disability. Listen to the person with the disability. Last night, as I left the office at about, um, I think it was about eight o'clock, I was going through a whole host of uh, things that ministers do at the end of the day and there were probably about a hundred letters there and I was reading them and going through them. The very last letter last night uh, that I got to, that I was uh, signing off uh, a response to somebody, was uh, a par a two, par two people, parents. I'm not going to use their names um, because I don't want to identify them. But I will say that uh, they had a daughter who was 45. I'm, I've only been the minister in this portfolio now for uh, just over a year and a bit. Um, and they were writing to me about something that occurred in 2015. And it was only a paragraph, but it was a very telling paragraph. It was about their 45-year-old daughter with a disability. And what they said to me was that uh, she had died in January of 2015 after years of agony, three separate lots of surgery. She was eventually, post her death, diagnosed with ovarian cancer, but had been under having surgery for obstructed bowels. And they made the point that they felt that in the past, when we had, and I'm not by any means supporting this particular position, but I understand where they're coming from. They are making the point that when their daughter was at Stockton, there were people there who actually treated her respectfully and in an understanding way. Now, I don't support, I, I'm, I'm well and truly in that space where I think that people with intellectual disabilities shine when they're out in the community. Um, that's a, a debate that's long gone. But the point they were making was that nobody understood, respectfully treated or listened to their daughter's particular issue. That is the challenge for us, to make sure that in a very big health system and in allied systems that operate with health at a very particular point in our, in our history, that is as we move into this uh, new NDIS world, that we make sure that our staff at the front line, whether it's in local health districts, whether it's in the government health system or whether it's the GPs, whatever aspect of the health system, that they understand and listen to what we need to convey to them on behalf of if we are the person with the intellectual disability, that we can convey that, or if we're not capable of doing that, that a carer is being listened to. Your forum, your round table, I think, is uh, a great uh, opportunity to send the message out in a very collective and collaborative way from some of the the brightest and most capable people in the country, that there are 400,000 people with intellectual disabilities across this country that could benefit from listening and being able to give a far more informed way of working with a very important section of our community.